This video is brought to you by the lovely guys over at Robotoys. For all your Hasbro, Takara, third party and knockoff desires, Robotoys has you covered. For 10% off, use the code DOCTORLOCK10% off at the checkout. The code has unlimited uses, so go for it. Now on to today's diagnosis. Ah, Titans Return. The true gem in the sea of mediocrity that was the Primal's trilogy. To this day, Shuffler remains one of my favourite small-scale figures, and the Titan Master lineup proved to be something truly special. Sure, it had its fair share of fumbles, but the way they incorporated the heads into the actual bodies of the robots was truly inspired, and many of the figures hold a dear place in my heart. Yep. Then Battle of the Primes came along and shot all over its legacy! They're not really bad per se, but they all do the exact same thing. They transform the exact same way, and they're just so boring. There's no actual nuance to the transformation. The original Pretenders were interesting because of what they did with the core robot designs, because they transformed into interesting things, and those core robots formed the basis for many updates of the Pretenders, like Thunderwing in the original Generations line, or was it Classics? I don't know. But what do we get with these guys? We got headmasters that just slot right in that way, and they didn't even have a cool head on the back, and they all integrated the exact same, and there's no articulation, and it's all very boring. I mean, what they essentially did was take a snippet of white noise, and then copy-paste, 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 copy-paste. The most interesting thing they did with it was the Power of the Prime's Optimal Optimus with the set that came with the scepter, and you could stick them on as cores. That was the only time they did anything interesting. I wouldn't mind if they reused the same design again and again, if the original design had actually brought something new to the table. Which is why I'm really excited for more Siege Seekers, because that is a really good mould, but this is just boring. And to think I originally thought they were an awesome concept when I originally came into contact with them at the Power of the Primes Hasbro event I was invited to. I really want Hasbro to do another one of those, it would be quite fun. Then Siege brought their MicroMasters, and oh boy was I excited. Now, contrary to popular belief, I do actually enjoy Generation 1 toys. In fact, that should have been evident in my Tailgate multi-review. But the ones that I do actively try to collect every mold of are the G1 MicroMasters, because, as you know, I'm a small-scale fanatic. So, can Siege rectify the errors of Power of the Primes? Do these MicroMasters truly have the power to survive? Well, greeting Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, today's diagnosis- It's not survive, you ninny! Sorry, what? It's not survive, it's surprise, motherfucker. Not to mention, it's for pretenders, not micro masters, you bastard. Who even are you? Well, I'm the guy you sent to Bunnings to get your goddamn hammer. You forgot about me. I have no memory of this place. Hmm. Aren't you supposed to be working on your 50th anniversary extravaganza instead of this MicroMaster shit? F*** off. Traitor! Contrary to popular belief, these aren't MicroMasters in the traditional sense. Sure, they are remakes of characters who were originally MicroMasters in Generation 1, but the approach that Hasbro takes this time is actually quite different. The closest thing we got to modern-style MicroMasters recently was actually the Minicons in Thrilling 30, because this time these MicroMasters are pretty much generations-ified versions of modern Legion-class figures. Yes, we've gotten Generations, Legion, Legend-sized figures in the past, but they fit more in style of the classic Legends figures as opposed to the Legions we have today. Today. There's a clear design philosophy difference between pre and post Cyberverse Legion figures. Yes, one could argue that these MicroMasters also exhibit a different design philosophy altogether, but my point is mainly that they share way more with the recent Energon Igniter Speed Series toys than anything Generation 1 put out. And come on, each set is literally the price of two Legion figures, and they're virtually the same size. You can't tell me I'm wrong here. Seeing as we're discussing both of the first two waves today, it's only logical that we discuss the waves in order. I feel a good place to start is the race car patrol team, as these two are not only the most micromastery figures of the bunch, but they also provide a good template for how the rest of the new figures function. Road Handler has proven to be the poster boy of the new micromasters lineup, probably because he's the most vivid out of the first wave. Right off the bat, you can see that the designs of these micromasters are very different in comparison to the rest of the siege line. These guys lean hard into the G1 aesthetic, whereas anything deluxe or higher goes for a more cyberpunk feel, whether in the flavor of Blade Runner, Blade Runner 2049, Alien, Coruscant, or does Halo count as cyberpunk? 
Regardless, Road Handler takes a much more angular approach than his G1 predecessor, and aside from the window layout, it feels more like another character's mold got reused. Almost as if they had plans for a repaint down the line, and just kind of merged the two designs together. Gotta say, I dig the new route they took with the updates. Looks like some sort of future car from Back to the Future. So, it's only fitting that Swindler takes several design cues from the DeLorean. Now, I'll admit, the original leaned into that reference much harder, especially with the vents on the back, but I do prefer the boxier front section. It feels more utilitarian, with a middle-class edge as opposed to SPACE CAR! Overall, I still do prefer the original, ever so slightly thanks to the lack of the vents on the back of the new one, but it's not that big of a deal. If anything, the reasoning is more frustrating than the design itself. It's not really much to complain about overall though. Sure, these two are nothing groundbreaking, unlike their predecessors from two lines prior, but they're solid. The only gripe I have is the sloppiness of the paint job. I understand the lack of paint, given the budgets, but more effort could have been put into the layout. If you're gonna skimp on budget, at least make the outlines crisp and clear. Other than that, I guess the Autobot logo placement is a little weak. They're a tad small, and they could have benefited from being on the windshield. If you've ever transformed a MicroMaster before, you probably know how these are going to work. The transformation scheme is almost one-to-one, -one, with one notable exception. The strange thing about Swindler is that the bonnet of the car becomes the backpack, as opposed to forming the chest. I'm not too fussed, but it's an odd choice considering both Swindler and Blackjack, the yet-to-be-released repaint variant, use the same transformation system with the bonnet on the front. If I had to guess, it's probably because of the potential looseness of the pieces, coupled with the stupid combining gimmick from the gun that requires a 5mm port. But ah well, what's done is done. In robot mode, well, they certainly are slightly upscaled MicroMasters, warts and all. Road Handler is pretty much a spitting image of his G1 counterpart, only with a slightly less angular chest to make way for the 5mm port, and far less blue. Only the latter really bothers me, because everything else got shoved into the articulation and proportions department. The proportions, right off the bat, are great. They're powerful, yet echoing similar design cues from the Titan and Prime Masters from lines past. The head design, although a tad messy when it comes to the paint, is a brilliant representation. Yes, he's got a much bigger backpack, but it's a tiny figure with a limited budget, so it's barely noticeable. On first glance, it might look like he has less plastic quantity than a Prime or Titan Master set, but in reality, it's all been shrunk into a compact little unit. For such a small guy, he's certainly a looker. Wish I could say the same about Swindler. Part of what made the original so great was the abundance of blue, and now that it's gone, we're left with way too much grey. Granted, it's not quite Games Workshop grey, so it looks nice enough, but there's not much to break it up, and in the end it just looks boring. That's not the main issue with the figure though, although it is a substantial one. These shoulders are f terrible. The clearance tier doesn't allow for any outward movement, and that might not seem like a problem on its own, but it makes transforming him a goddamn nightmare. They call back to the original toy's shoulder placement, but there should have been way more clearance in the chest area, at the very least. As it stands, he's one of the most annoying MicroMasters to transform, although I definitely say he's not the absolute worst. Articulation is surprisingly good for the size. They both have the same, outside of Swindler's problems. They have ball-jointed shoulders, ball-jointed hips, unhampered knees, and... waist swivels? Part of the combining gimmick allows full rotation, and it does allow some decent poses. It is unfortunate that we don't have an elbow bend to complete the full posing power, but it is something I'm rather happy for. Of course, that very waist swivel is what allows them to transform into their gun modes. You get the option of dual wielding or combining them in two separate ways, even though the instructions don't tell you that. The combined mode is stupid in both configurations, and neither is pretty solid too. The individual guns aren't great either though, so it's a bit of a lose-lose situation. In the end, you're left with a mode you're probably not going to use, and one member that's a nightmare to transform. I mean, they're alright, but they're far from the best. Things are looking much more solid here design-wise. Big Shot, renamed as Top Shot for copyright reasons, creates the illusion of being in a much smaller scale through tiny details and paint applications all over. The earthy military colour scheme is absolutely lovely, and the turret is perfectly stubby. Sure, it's not as long as the original, but it has full rotation and swivelling, so there's no posing issues whatsoever. Compared to the original... I don't have the original. Yes, the Battle Patrol is the only MicroMaster set currently out where I don't have the original to compare them to. I mean, I could have gotten Sunrunner, but last time I saw him, the seller was charging $45 at Oz Comic Con. F scalpers. Flack didn't go through a name change, as the name's been around since at least the Dark of the Moon days. His alt mode is... odd to say the least. I mean, it's not bad per se, but it is quite humorous. You should see my reaction when I unboxed him.
that's a, that's, a, <laughs> that's hilarious. Look at the proportions of that thing. Oh my god, that is just a hoot. Unfortunately, he doesn't have any designer intended articulation here. You can unhinge the legs to simulate a hinged rocket launcher, but it looks hella sketchy. Overall though, I was already into the race car patrol, but these two guys in vehicle modes are all sorts of cool. Transformation this time is far more streamlined. No choke points, no hazards with tabs, and no fiddly bits. They also deviate from the traditional MicroMaster archetype a bit more, although that's probably thanks to the source material as opposed to the current designers. Flack looks like he's wearing a big red diaper and a big grey football chest plate. The head sculpt is lovely, but the colour layout is super sketchy, and beyond that he doesn't have that much going for him. The proportions are about as wonky as the original with serviceable legs and spindly arms, but everything else is kind of uneventful. At least he's got dedicated heel struts, because otherwise the backpack would cause some hefty standing issues. Big Shot on the other hand looks rather nice. Still not as visually striking as the race car team, but his silhouette is spot on, and he gets past the shoulder pose ability problem with no issue. My only gripe is- OH GOD THAT FACE! What kind of sick bastard would let this malformed, horribly painted thing into existence? How is this okay? How did anyone sign off on this? I will say that it doesn't ruin the figure overall though. He's a solid little guy, and hey, you can even rotate the turret over his head. Nice touch. Articulation for Big Shot is the same as the race car patrol team, and the only difference with Flack is that he lacks a waist swivel. The transformation on the gun mode doesn't require it, so most likely it was just cut from the budget. On that topic, the transformation to gun mode works! It feels solid, well thought out, and precise. The connections feel deliberate, the gun mode looks cohesive, the colours blend nicely, and other toys actually look cool holding it! The only real downside is visible head syndrome, but hey, I guess the mangled nature of the face works in its favour? I don't know. All I know is that the set manages to do something that the irreverent Titan Master sets were never able to fully accomplish, properly delivering on a gun mode. Originally I thought this set was alright, but this, this makes it truly special. Why are these the only Decepticons in the first wave? Seriously. How is it that no-name grunt sets are devoid of Decepticons, kind of what makes up no-name grunt sets usually? Hell, why is Siege devoid of Decepticons overall? Anyway, moving on, out of all the updated MicroMasters, Stormcloud is by far the closest to his G1 counterpart out of all of these. The tooling here is strikingly close to the original, right down to the extra wings near the nose cone. Granted, the undercarriage is a bit messier than the original, but hey, all Transformers jets have an undercarriage. It's part of collecting Transformers at this point. We've been through this already. The G1 accuracy isn't what makes this figure great, though. Oh no, it's the paint applications. Compared to the other MicroMasters, this character has so many little blemishes here and there. The sculpt work is already brilliant, but the extra little details really bring it to life. Vispa is exactly the same, although there have been more liberties taken in comparison to the original design. And yes, he underwent a name change too, from Whisper, but goddammit, Vispa sounds so much cooler, so I'ma just call him that. Yes, he's more angular than the original, and as such I find the original a little more unique, but hot Damn, the paint is better here. The extra red really makes it pop, whereas the original can seem like a huge black mess of nothingness. All in all, f**k these are good. I can't wait to see how the other two jets will be handled. Now yes, I am aware that Siege only gives us two MicroMasters per set as opposed to all four, but honestly, I don't really mind. Considering the budget limitations and considering how there would be $40 for a single set if they included all four, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Plus, there are leaked listings of a box set of the MicroMasters later down the line, and many have theorized that it's actually going to include the other two from each of the sets, so that you can have a full set of four. Who knows, maybe we'll get that. Out of all the MicroMasters, these have the least MicroMastery transformations. The designers really took liberties to facilitate the combining gimmick. Stormcloud especially does some really cool things with the arms to fit into the fuselage, and the end result is... <sighs> We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. I mean, they're fine and all in this mode, but we had such brilliant vehicle modes already. So why couldn't we get fantastic robot modes too? As much as I love the paint in the vehicle mode, did it really have to come at the cost of the robot mode? Couldn't we have gotten anything? Maybe some plastic breakup? Stormcloud's face is fine, but Jesus Christ, what happened to that backpack? The entire alt mode's back here. I get that this thing is a tiny toy to begin with, but come on, this isn't okay. Then you've got Vispa with a reasonable backpack, but f hell, that face is terrible. Now, I'll admit the originals weren't quite the lookers either, but that's what reinvention is for. It's not terrible though, the proportions are pretty spot on, thanks to the backpack aspect, I suppose. And the articulation on both is pretty solid. Vispa has your standard affair and neither has a waist swivel, 
but Stormcloud adds extra elbows facilitated by his transformation, and it works wonders. Honestly, out of all the MicroMasters, he might be my favourite. The combined weapon here goes for a much different approach in comparison to the other three sets. It's a very solid affair, being probably the best of the bunch. Just fold back the nose cone, peg them together, and bada bing bada boom, it's Star Saber! Okay, not that Star Saber, although Hasbro really should get on that, especially with the evolution gimmick returning from the power of the primes. I really like the approach they took here, and honestly allows me to overlook many of the robot mode flaws. The gimmick isn't that intrusive, all things considered, and as someone who's owned the original Star Saber twice over, three times if you count the random one I bought in Tasmania, I can safely say that the new one is just better. The profiling is far less crazy, and although the actual blade element is a lot less prominent, it's still clearly visible. Yes, it could be a little bigger, as right now it just looks like an oversized knife. But it's a lovely feature and it pushes things right into the stratosphere. That's not a knife. That's a knife. Unfortunately, we have to bring things down to below average now, with Wave 2 kicking off with two disappointments. Mm, hang on. Aha! Did you think you could get away with it? Think you can take me? Don't forget me! Oh my god, sorry. You're done! Oh my god, you poor, poor thing. Look at what they've done to you! The sweet boxy Thunderbirdy goodness of the original has given way to... to this! So many baffling choices with the mold! Why is the ladder so terrible? Hasbro already got it right the first time around, so why do they have to pull a Magic Square hard fire and make it a hollow mess? Well, okay, maybe it's not that bad. The window section just looks plain ugly! thanks to the complete disregard of the tooling on the original. What was once clean and precise windows on the tank have become a messy windshield, with bumps and wrinkles in all the wrong places. All the lovely sculpted detail gets washed out with the abundance of red plastic, and the headlight is barely pronounced. They went to the effort of retooling what was once the grey runner, and is now a white one, right down to the intricacies on the heel struts. But if they went to all that trouble, why not just make a new mould? Honestly, why even bother? I actually bought the Red Hot figure before Big Shot, so it made me appreciate the latter way more than I usually would have. Although I should probably mention that he got worse in his rename. Red Hot to Red Heat. That doesn't sound like trademarks to me, that sounds like censorship. God, this figure is already a letdown. Red Hot Mama from Louisiana, girl you sure look like a piece of sh** to me. Unfortunately, Stakeout got a bit of a downgrade too. I think you're mean holy! I was gonna f*** off already! At first glance, he looks alright, with the classic not in Bumblebee barricade sort of vibe going on. Hell, he could pass for Barry if there weren't a proper deluxe on the horizon. Apparently, the Cybertronian text on the side says police, just like the original, but it's reversed on the other side, so the text gets reversed too. I have no qualms with the revised design here, but seriously, how could they get the colours wrong? This is unacceptable! They went from a luscious grey to a solid black? I won't stand for this. I'm gonna contact Hasbro and give them a piece of my- What do you mean they're both discoloured and both of them were black to begin with? Hello? Hello? Okay, so apparently Stakeout is the OG black police car, and I guess is alright in this mode. I especially like how the red light bar got swapped out for both colours. Other than that, it's a pretty standard affair. It's a shame they took the two most boring members of the set, as opposed to the actually creative ones. But hey, the box set later should rectify that, I hope. Now, in theory, the transformations should be easy enough. Stakeout just follows the MicroMaster formula with no alterations, and Red Heat reuses the same system from Big Shot. Unfortunately, it can be very difficult at times due to the horrible leg tolerances. Not only do you have to contend with the new ladder piece getting in the way of the heel struts, but the hips have a tendency to just fall off during transformations and even light posing. I can understand the blunder with stakeouts, but I can't excuse Red Heat, who was actually worse. Since they've already had one perfectly functioning version of the mold, there's simply no reason for them to fail so poorly, especially considering the white parts are completely remolded, so there shouldn't be any mold degradation. In robot mode, both are fine. Just fine. Stakeout has some rather good proportions compared to the original, and the likeness in the face was captured really well. I also like how they got rid of his silver underpants, they were kind of stupid. Still, he really could have used more blue. It's part of his identity, and it's been stripped away. I actually really like what they've done with Red Heat. The torso layout kind of works, and the head is far more detailed than the last. It also turns, but you have to get some kind of tool in there to get it to work. Better than having visible head syndrome, though. The main issue with him, though, is that he simply can't stand. The loose legs were bad enough on Stakeout, but they're so bad on Red Heat that it makes posing him an exercise in frustration. If they were to fix this, I could be a lot more forgiving of this set, but it really brings them down a notch. 
Aside from that, the articulation is pretty stock standard. They both have the same as everyone else, aside from Red Heat's added head. As for the gun mode, well, it's like the Battle Patrol version, only terrible. This thing is held together by metaphorical string and duct tape. It's gappy, it only uses one port, and the legs don't lock in anywhere. And they don't even have the decency of being able to split apart. I mean, you can use stake out as a pistol, but not Red Heat. Kinda defeats the purpose. And with that, we're done with the Micromasters, in a manner of speaking. The review isn't quite over yet, as we still have one set to go. Now, I don't really consider these Micromasters, as from a designing standpoint, they're so different from everyone else. Seems like they were just shoved into the size class so that Soundwave could have some powers to shove in his chest. Speaking of which, I suppose I should quickly cover Soundwave. Eh. 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 I mean, it's alright overall. Though it mode is a solid enough representation of his G1 counterpart, his vehicle mode quickly grows on you and his articulation is pretty spot on. But he's just got no style of his own. He brings nothing new to the table, and in the end, I think Starscream is just a better figure. At least he can do this with Laserbeak. Wasn't my idea, I just found it on Facebook. Right, back on topic. As usual, Ravage and Laserbeak turn into cassettes, or more accurately, vague rectangles that kind of represent cassettes. But you won't care because it's f***ing Ravage and Laserbeak. Yes, they aren't as good as the Masterpiece versions, but at 10 bucks, what did you really expect? There's virtually nothing to say about them other than the fact that you can peg them into the 5mm ports for some reason, despite the fact that it makes no sense. As usual, they do the thing in Soundwave's bra and the eject mechanism works adequately. Oh, who am I kidding? None of this matters anyway! The joy of these figures lie in the transformation, and unfortunately so do the frustrations. Laserbeak transforms effortlessly into a perfect representation of his Cybertronian rendition, whereas you really have to fight with Ravage to get everything to fit into place. I'm honestly shocked how many parts he has at this tiny scale, although I guess that's to be expected when Laserbeak only needs 10 in total. Not much in the grand scheme of things, but oh boy does Ravage fill out the remaining parts count. The back legs are especially a pain. Figuring it out isn't the hard part, it's making sure those tiny back legs get out properly. And the end result is... F***ing hilarious! Laserbeak is a beautiful, elegant bird that perches on top of Soundwave's shoulder. Ravage is the chunk man! Laserbeak's paintwork is magnificent, especially on the wings, and the Cybertronian-style visor differentiates him from every other version. Chonk man! Don't get me wrong, I don't hate Ravage at all. I just find him hilariously entertaining. And hey, I'm an Iron Factory veteran, so I'm no stranger to overweight Ravages. I mean, what did you expect? Masterpiece quality? Hasbro's gotta stick to those budgets, man. Not much choice in the long run. What they've done with the size class is truly inspired. These are a far cry from what we've gotten in Titan's Return. These cassettes actually feel like the designers gave a damn, and they don't have any stupid third mode thrown in there. Although to be fair, I did kind of like the tank mode on the rewind mold. That was kind of cool. Articulation. There is none. I guess Laserbeak's wings move in and out, and the heads on both of them move, but does that really count? Beast formers are usually bricks anyway, it's a fact of life. Gun mode. Nope, not happening. So I suppose I should rank these from best to worst. Last place is pretty obvious. There's fun to be had with the rescue team, but there's simply too many flaws for me to recommend them. I said it in the World War II Bumblebee review, and I'll say it again. A toy needs to fundamentally be able to stand, and well, a Legion toy that can't stand is a special kind of failure. Following that, the race car team is okay, I guess. It's an alright introduction to the size class, and you'll enjoy them if you get them, though they won't change your mind if you're on the fence. I'd say just save the money. Technically, the cassette cons aren't really Micromasters, but they fill out the size class, so I guess I have to rank them. They're definitely fun on their own, and I do think Ravage will still win over most people who don't like the weight he's put on. The size helps a lot. Still, most of you will be getting him for Soundwave anyway, so I don't really need to convince you. The Battle Patrol, on the other hand, should be convincing enough. It's one of the few that generally executes all three modes across both toys extremely well. Yes, Flax Robot Mode is a little bit weird, but that's just part of his charm. Still, as good as they are, they all pale in comparison to the undisputed champions, the Airstrike Patrol Team. All modes are absolutely stellar, and the added Unicron Trilogy throwback is a wonderful bonus. I do fear we've picked too early with these, as the future seems to be holding far less interesting characters in its lineup. I mean, it's possible that we could get some surprises in the last two waves, but I'm still not holding my breath. I just hope I'll have enough content for the second video in the series. When I conceptualized this review, I thought I'd originally be disappointed in the end because they didn't live up to the legacy of the Titans Return ones. However, especially when it comes to the top two, I think they're on par. Even up to the point where I was scripting this, I had the full thing figured out, but as I played with them and I wrote the script down on Microsoft Word, I slowly came to love these figures. Well, not the rescue team because they're terrible, but 
I love the other ones. I really hope they continue the MicroMasters with the rest of the War for Cybertron trilogy, and potentially in Generations lines after that, because there's a lot of potential with the concept. Especially with these guys, if you think about the combining elements, you can include both parts in the box set very well, and you don't have to worry about the weaponizing gimmick, because they already have a combined gimmick thrown in there. It's been a long journey. I went from incredibly excited at the announcement to incredibly disappointed when I first received them, to incredibly excited again as I've written this script. And I'm very glad to finally own these. And hey, at the end of the day, we can still laugh that we got MicroMaster updates before we got the Mastoy Seekers. No, I can't do it. I can't f laugh. I'm still salty as sh about this. God damn it, just release them already! Whoa, hang on a second, it would seem that I haven't actually plugged Robotoys properly, today's sponsor. Yes, I know I put the thing at the beginning, but still, I think I need to reiterate it. I've been using Robotoys for a very long time, and considering how the first wave of MicroMasters never properly made it to Australia, I thought I should probably purchase it from there. And they've actually got a good deal going on there. But MicroMasters are probably the most affordable of the Siege sets, and I mean in actual relation to the retail price. Of course, if you want a discount at Robotoys, you can always use the code DRLOCK10% off of the checkout, and you can also use it as many times as you like. There's no limit to how many times you can use it. So it's not just for new purchases, it's also if you've purchased there for a long time and just want to use a code anyway.